Okay, good day to everyone and thank you for joining Royal Property Group as we celebrate Africa Month and welcome to Africa 2020, which is Royal's series of bespoke industry engagements where we bring together the best in the business to ignite a conversation around business in Africa. We chose to launch our Royal Africa webinars now in honour of Africa Month. And today's webinar date was specifically chosen to honour Africa Day, which as we know was on Monday the 25th of May, but as this fell on a public holiday in some countries for the celebration of Eid, we're having the webinar today instead. So as we know, Africa Day commemorates the founding of the Organisation of African Unity, now known as the African Union, in 1963. And the aim of Africa Day is to celebrate African unity, which is exactly what we're aiming to achieve today bring a unity, a collective conversation of Africa's inclusive growth, sustainable development and progress under the theme of a new vision. My name is Jess Cleland. I am the Group Managing Director for East Africa and Indian Ocean. And I'm joined by some of my colleagues from all across our continent, including Nigeria, Ghana, Namibia, Zambia, South Africa, Mozambique, Kenya and Uganda. And we wanted to bring together Brol's regional expertise in one place in this way to talk about how we create solutions for the challenges of tomorrow. Now, we've all seen the impact of COVID-19 in our markets, and we're all very familiar with how our governments and other stakeholders are reacting. So the point of this webinar is not to, to give a lecture or a rehash of those measures. It's to try and understand what are the commonalities and perhaps more importantly, what are some of the solutions that are working in other markets that we can maybe apply to our own situations? So this is going to be a little different to all the webinars on the impact of COVID-19 on the real estate market. And instead, we're going to focus on how we manage that impact. So our panelists will be sharing lessons learned and success stories of practical, innovative solutions from each country. And that's really the whole point of this conversation with you all. It's to rethink the way we do business and to grow a new and energetic ecosystem of stakeholders in our industry. So as we move through the conversation, you're welcome to submit questions to the panelists via the Q&A section below. And we're actually going to continue online after this discussion, uh, where we'll try to answer as many of these questions as we can. And we would love for you to stay online with us for that. We'll also be posting some poll questions throughout the webinar, and we ask you to join in and give us your thoughts on those as well. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out as a link to all the registered attendees, along with the responses to the polls. But to start with, I want to first take a macro view across the whole group. And to do that, I'm going to turn to Malcolm Horn, who is the group CEO of Roll Property Group. So Malcolm, COVID-19 has really been around long enough now for us to start reacting to it and adapting new solutions. So given your view of the entire range of services within the business, firstly, what do you see as the most exciting shifts in how property services are being delivered? And do you think these are going to be long-term adoptions that will endure even once lockdowns ease? Thanks, Jess, and good day to everyone. I think I've got to touch a little bit on COVID and then I'll get to the solutions. Um, but I do believe that COVID will not define our future, but it will rather shape the direction and the speed of our innovation and progress to continue with the African development agenda that we all hold so dear to our hearts. Because Africa needs to continue on this path of growth to sustain itself, for our businesses to sustain, for investment to sustain. And I think COVID has assisted us as a business thinking out of the box, reaching out, collaborating um, at all levels of business and, and as well um, intergovernmental. So because there's one common thread that is we all hold dear, and that's the future growth and sustainability of our people and of the continent. So just within our own business, and, and I'm going to reflect on what we've done during this period, but it's not because of COVID. I think it's in spite of COVID. Um, and I think I'd like to change the narrative away from COVID more to solutioning and long-term solutions that, that I think have been brewing and all that COVID has done has accelerated the implementation of some of these solutions. And I'm thinking of solutions like um, our brokerage division has been doing deals remotely during this time. So it's, it's, it's really innovating of how to take the service line to the market in a non-traditional manner. And they've been very successful closing out deals. We've done property auctions online, which we've launched. Uh, but I think more than that, more people are looking at an in-depth property service, which doesn't just relate to um, 
finding a singular service, but it's more designed around holistic solutions. And if you look at a company like Brawl Internal Developers, where we focus on the strategies of occupiers of space, understanding the impact on how their employees actually use that space and how the area can add value or detract from value. Um, and we've seen much of an uptake in these kind of strategic solutioning um, drives in the business, not only um, as far as pure occupiers are concerned, but investors of space where they're looking for, we've, we've launched a, something called Brawl Strategic Solutions, where businesses embrace a total solution design and implementation where technology plays a significant role in optimizing and monitoring the cost savings of hard and soft services. Um, or Brawl Risk Solutions, where, where you've got a management intervention which we optimizing companies' risks as far as employees and geographies and products they're offering. Um, so, so I think property services are defining themselves in new areas that were non-traditional. Um, yet, if we go into the valuation and advisory business, we're seeing more and more um, expert skill, demand for advisory and consulting in, in, in troubled times like these. So I think you've got the traditional services that are really pulling together, but we've seen a lot more long-term solutioning of innovation and expanding the ambit of what a traditional property services play will be. And I think we're excited about that. I'm excited about that because um, we need to work together with other people, other companies to facilitate um, pushing the boundaries of what we know as normal. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Malcolm. I think it's, uh, there's some really exciting changes, exciting changes there that are, are starting to accelerate quite quickly. Um, and here I'd actually also like to bring in Nkuli Bokopa, who is Bo's Managing Director of Investor Services in South Africa, to give us her perspective on the same question. So Nkuli, what are you seeing in the investor portfolios and clients that you're working with? Thank you very much, Jess. Um, I think on, on staying with uh, how we are best managing uh, the COVID impact. I think for me, what I've seen that is really great is the closer collaboration between public sector and our private sector in finding solutions to, to the problem and working together. Uh, obviously, at the heart of our shopping centers are the communities that we serve. And so we've had to see a lot of uh, interaction with the departments of health, etc and us making sure that we are solutioning and making sure that the regulations are actually being adhered to and complied with i think what has also been um, really positive and i hope that it stays with us um, that has come out of this is agility you know how we've all had to just adapt as quickly as possible regulations come out today and by tomorrow we are already implementing and I'd like to you know, recognize our teams who have been very agile in terms of their response. I think the plunge into tech, um, we couldn't have done it any better way. I think uh, everybody's been talking about 4IR, but it had to be the COVID that actually, actually plunged us into tech and we've had to find solutions and make it work. And it's working and it's amazing. I think for me, um, the other positive is just a lot more connectivity and interaction. You know, I think prior to COVID, um, we thought we were connected because we were seeing each other physically, but uh, I haven't seen you in a very long time. And post, you know, since COVID, we are talking to each other and interacting more with other regional offices across our business a lot more often. And I think that is something that I would like to see carry on. I think the other item um, that is most critical in our space specifically is the tenant focus. We've come to realize that tenant, uh, tenant is king uh, and so is the end user, our consumer. A consumer is today a lot more conscious and keeping us uh, a lot more honest. And I think that we need to just sustain those types of relationships and that type of client focus. Sustainability is obviously something that we will have to make sure that we move ahead with full steam um, as we have seen what this pandemic has done is to show us that we are not self-sustainable. And I think across the various uh, countries in Africa, the search for PPE and the scramble back to China to get those supplies is teaching and hopefully teaching our governments that we really, really have to learn to be a lot more sustainable and self self self-sufficient as country. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kuli. I think it's pretty clear that the whole industry isn't just grinding to a halt, um, but there are a lot of people working very hard to make sure that it keeps going. Yeah. So on that note, I'm going to turn now to Jose Castillo, who is Brawl's managing partner in Mozambique. So Jose, how are you managing to make sure that existing deals are being sustained? And how do you maintain and energize a deal pipeline post the peak of COVID-19? Hi, Jess. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me and good day to all and welcome everyone. Um, well, I'd like to start to say that uh, COVID was seen by us at a very early stage as a contingency. And that makes us uh, look with big eyes to the market and see what, what was happening. It's just like uh, Nikuli just said that uh, this is now a tenant's market or a customer's market. We, we had to look at all the impacts that we actually had in uh, the had coming in with, with this, uh, this crisis of the COVID or this contingency more. And uh, we, we actually uh, analyzed the, the market and we went on to the three major things that we think uh, was the, the major impacts that we would have in, in Mozambique. Fortunately, as you know, uh, Mozambique was not in total lockdown and that allowed us to go on working, of course, uh, within some certain rules. But we then identified that the major impacts that we would have would be the focus on the struggle for the hospitality industry. That was the first industry to be affected. Then we looked at the hazards of the, all the expats that were in, in, in Mozambique that run businesses. And this causes a big impact in the economy. And furthermore, what we looked is that these expats that were leaving the country would need support from people in the country. And we fortunately are here. And then we looked at all other things on the economy, like the drop of the oil prices that, as you know, affects very well the, the economy in Mozambique because we're very dependent on utilities also, like the rest of Africa, I believe. So looking at that, we had to define internally what our focus is. And we focused more than on the local investor and what we could present to those investors. So. First, what we've done is to compile a very comprehensive list of the assets that we have seen in our portfolio as an opportunity for now and after this, uh, in this crisis. And we've started distributing that with focus on those investors. Then, uh, looking more into the, the real deals that we do on, on a daily basis, is uh, we had to change some procedures on closing the retail deals, for instance. What we've done in this aspect is we continue to, to, to present our deals to our potential tenants and all the people that is involved in, in retail. And we were actually able to close deals in that area by changing the start date of, uh, of, the, of the leases that they would, uh, that would take. So what that means is that we actually carry on with the deals ongoing and we kind of agree with the tenants when they would start and, uh, and, and we were really happy to, to close deals in two of the major shopping centers that we manage here in, in Mozambique. And then we needed to maintain a closer relationship with all landlords that are outside the country and need our support here, as well as all the investors. And that's really what we are doing. Then we focus on managing our comprehensive list of assets and opportunities, deals that we can present to investors. And this became bigger because we actually were able to close one of the bids that we were in to manage one portfolio of one of, one of the major uh, players here in, uh, in Mozambique and that's, we were very happy with that, which is a great success story. And by the way, we are now turning to that uh, portfolio and not only we are selling from their portfolio, but we are also selling to them. So it's, this is the amazing thing that we could do because of course there are opportunities out there. So with that in mind, basically, and just to, to resume what I, what, I, what I just said, is that uh, we've been able to close deals, we've been able to close tenants deals on retail shopping, we extended our portfolio, and we have been advising all the landlords on what we can do here in Mozambique for them. And um, of course, we had to invest in studies of marketing or markets, and uh, we have to get more in-depth uh, information from, from the market. We will has, expect that return to come after this, uh, this, this crisis. But we created uh, some good opportunities here, we can maintain our network alive. We can maintain the relationship with our partners. As Nkuli also said, there is more this, this way of communicating today uh, where we see everybody on video and, uh, using like, like we're doing like this, uh, 
webinar, which is which is a good thing that came to us. And uh, now looking into to the future, today we're looking at uh, maybe Mozambique is now getting, and all Africa is getting getting more towards the peak of this disease. So we might get more uh, constraints on this on this contingency of, of COVID. So we are really starting to look at new opportunities and what are the needs in Africa. And for instance, we just identified one, which is affordable housing, that we think that after the crisis will even be a bigger necessity. So we're looking at this team and we're finding creative solutions and innovative solutions to approach these issues. And that is what, what we're really uh, keen on. And that is part of our success until now. We tend to keep this uh, life and uh, for this reason, we, we remain very active and very confident on, in the future. And I think everybody, you as, as colleagues, and everybody that is listening to you, to us in, in, this, in this webinar, will obviously find solutions, will ob obviously find new ways of doing business. So let's keep confidence. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jose. I think you, you touched on, uh, or you mentioned a, a lot of stakeholders in your answer. And I think it's pretty clear that the, the global nature of this pandemic means that, that everyone has a role to play um, right throughout the value chain. So from the tenants to the landlord, to the financial institutions, to the government. Um, and I think that the most successful and sustainable outcomes will come from solutions where everyone shares the burden. So. On this, I'd like to ask Moses Lutalu, who's Brol's Managing Director in Uganda, for your experience here, Moses, because one of the key roles that, that we at Brol have been playing is emphasising the need for discussions right throughout that value chain. So Moses, what are some of the issues here? How have you approached these discussions? And what are the reactions from different stakeholders? Thank you, Jess. Uh, from a purely Ugandan perspective, I mean, just coming out of a lockdown for just two and a half months, uh, what, for example, our central government is trying to do through the central bank is to come up with some sort of credit relief measures, basically trying to get commercial banks to restructure debt obligation to developers and even some tenants. And the, the, the intention is to ensure that some of these, you know, sort of restructured debts, uh, the same sort of terms can be mirrored to the tenants. But of course, uh, with a sort of environment that we operate in, in Kampala, there are a lot of gray areas. Uh, I mean, we, we had the president come up one of the days and give a directive that, for example, landlords cannot evict tenants. Uh, and this uh, is a bit challenging because there's no legal instrument that can enforce that. And at the same time, you cannot go against the state. So we're likely to see some of these uh, directives being challenged in the medium to long term. Uh, and, and of course, uh, lawyers are already having a field on this, but um, given the sort of uh, unregulated property market in Kampala, what we're trying to do as Brawl Uganda is to try and broker fruitful conversations between the landlords and the tenants with a view of first realizing um, things like rent deferments as a first priority because we cannot be having discussion now on rent concessions until we you know, try to zero down how many months affected. Uh, so we're looking at the first three months that uh, the, the occupiers will be able to trade. And, and that's one of the considerations that we're looking at. Uh, and then uh, if you look at uh, the approach we're using in terms of uh, the different um, tenants, whether investors or occupiers, we want to think that no one size can fit all. So we're looking at uh, different tenants, their, per, their sort of profile, what um, their sort of uh, size is in a particular development. Uh, and, and we're looking at majorly first the local retailers who we think have been hit hard. They don't have the balance sheet to sort of support uh, the sort of uh, shocks that come out of um, post COVID or even during. So we think if we can get the local retailers uh, to get rent concessions, to, to get you know, interventions from the central government, we're able to sustain the business. Similar to the private developers who we think don't, uh, are not your typical institutional investors, that have you know, huge balance sheets and probably diversify the investments. We, we think if we can get the, the local retailers, the local developers, the small guys to, to be able to survive this uh, through a win-win situation, then probably all of us will see this uh, to, to, the, to the next level. And we, we think this is a sort of win-win situation which both the tenant and the landlord need to get because their relationship is sort of symbiotic in nature. Um, that said, I think uh, from um, a macro point of view, 
we've been promised by our Minister of Finance that they're going to come up with more comprehensive stimulus package that would people uh, look at things like credit, uh, taxation, interest rates, and that's why we think a, a lot of the solid and workable interventions are going to come. But um, generally, we are trying to, uh, we've been able to actually close some deals uh, from a leasing point of view during the lockdown period, majorly because some of your government entities are now putting into emphasis the social distancing measures, the four meter sort of work environment. So we're seeing a lot of demand coming from that sort of uh, um, demand drivers. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Moses. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, it's that, it's that relationship between the landlord and the tenant that is so crucial. And it all pivots around the lease agreement. So on that point, I'm going to turn to Sonia Deneka, who's the Divisional Director for Zambia, to ask firstly, what are you seeing in terms of the relief being offered to tenants? Secondly, how do we see future lease agreements possibly changing? And finally, what do you think will be the long-term impact on commercial and retail properties? Hi, Jess. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, good day, all. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, as Jose has previously mentioned, and you just said, and so rightly so, Moses, just as well, it seems like relationship building has never been this important, especially in Africa, between the landlord and the tenant. So landlord and tenants alike are currently facing the uncertainty of what uh, the continued lockdown means long term for the tenancy relationship but of course are formally governed by a lease agreement, mostly uh, historically. So in early in April, it became quite clear that our tenant bodies would not survive the impact of the pandemic without some kind of relief offered by the landlords. The question I think in everybody's mind were to what extent will this relief be offered and what the impact will be um, for both landlord and the tenant, of course. Our interaction with the landlords and the tenants have showed that whether a tenant may or may not pay a reduced rental during the lockdown period is an extreme complex and intricate question which is dependent on the facts of each individual matter. So no blanket recipe could have been applied to all and more so in Africa, as Moses also just mentioned you know, previously to me. So, the extent of the impact were measured on a case-by-case -case basis and each landlord had its own discretion in applying it. So some criteria of measurement that we used uh, included the turnover performance um, of such tenants, the type of business that they are running, the category that they fell into, the extent to which each tenant can trade, of course, and the strength of that balance sheet of each tenant. We then opened up discussion and communication channels between the various options, the landlord and the tenants. And we found that there was a various um, uh, relief offered, some delayed or deferred uh, payments. Some landlords deferred payments for even up to three months. Um, a payment holiday were granted by some landlords giving 100% concession for April. Uh, and May is still outstanding, we might even do that. So. There was the utilization of deposits in lieu of rental payments by some landlords. Um, we had reduction in payments uh, between 30 and 50% for April and May. Some even, some landlords even paying the exchange rate in Zambia <clears throat> for a period of time. So we found that despite the tendency for parties to adopt different uh, stances, communication increased between the landlord and the tenants. It had to intensify. And I think that was necessary to, you know, have the survival of both. So it has never been this essential that parties consider one another for working together to find a beneficial solution. Um, in these distressed times, uh, you know, I'm always reminded of the spirit of Ubuntu in Africa. And I think this was truly embraced. Most landlords realize the strict enforcement of the lease agreement will not be beneficial for tenants and agreed to, to at the very least to continue to pay for essential services. Uh, the tenants then agreed mostly uh, to continue paying that essential services of operating costs and rates and taxes and electricity, um, uh, security services and the rest still had to be paid. And I think our common law lease agreements in Africa will have to be infused in the future with the spirit of Ubuntu and good faith. Um, 
And just moving on, uh, the future of lease agreements, what does it look like? Um, we do anticipate a rental rights drop um, in the future, some maybe up to 50%. Many tenants want to already now renegotiate their leases, their terms of lease accordingly. And uh, we will have to just wait a little bit longer with that and see how this pandemic pans out. In terms of the retail turnover rental clauses, we will definitely have an evolution, I'm sure about that. Turnover rents are likely to dissipate, dissipate except for maybe the likes of supermarket, or that will still have rental turnover clauses. But we might even see other revenue lines being charged turnover rental on that wasn't there before. So the time will tell. Flexible lease options will have to be considered in the future. I think COVID-19 has highlighted that. Although property lease agreements include exit clauses for these types of situations, there has been little obvious lease cancellation activity in our retail centers, uh, and we monitor our tenants um, very closely. Um, one of the options that started gaining momentum in the response of specific needs of emerging businesses um, unable to make long-term commitments like for, you know, for on, on a commercial space is the use of shared office space with its flexibility and short-term lease options. Tenants will be looking for shorter lease terms, as I just said, um, at, at the current scenario. And landlords might be looking at redeveloping traditional office spaces that were structured to accommodate one tenant in shared office space to accommodate now multiple tenants from various industries. In future, um, we will even see tenant installation requirements, I think, change in lease agreements. Fitouts would need to look at including features that may be more in demand um, after our current scenario. Things like hand-free tech for doors is likely to grow. We've seen the no touch lift buttons and security access is any feature that does not require touch to be operating. I think there will be some, some requests for this, uh, for that. Um, services that resist contamination will also be in more demand. And I think will be potentially become a selling point when you list your properties. Like for example, ventilation systems that reduce the risk of spreading germs. Um, the need for fast internet speed, I think, is going to be there more than ever because of the connectivity with people um, via uh, fiber connections. Um, so that might be an option. So the long-term impact as we see it um, currently for office space, um, in terms of occupied demand, tenants may not necessarily demand lower rentals, but they will definitely look at their space requirements. So a reduction of floor space may occur as tenants who have evolved to utilize digital technology over this hibernation period, look to reduce their non-essential space that were previously, I think, utilized for group gatherings, you know, and functions. Uh, we might see renegotiations and structuring of leases and an emphasis on a highly and hygienic environment, health conscious in the office sector. It includes an increased focus also on overall employee wellness. Um, the retail, I think in Africa and Zambia, the large majority of people from African countries still view visits to retail centers and malls as a far more than just, you know, merely shopping for them. They are typically social and entertainment outings and hotspots, uh, and they fulfill an important role in the local communities, you know, often involving the whole family going to the mall for an outing and enabling widespread interaction with neighbors and friends. However, while this aspect of retail activity has meant that the COVID-19 lockdown have had a large impact on shops and communities in Africa and in Zambia, it also points to the potential for healthy and relatively speedy recovery for the African retail sector once our customers have adapted. In conclusion, I think we'll see new clauses being drafted by the legal profession to cover similar events, providing more flexibility for the landlords and tenants alike in times of significant uncertainty. Thank you very much, Jess. Great, thank you, Sonia. I think there were there are a lot of really important points there that um, you know, there's so many options when it comes to these, these 
discussions between landlords and tenants. Um, so, I mean, the, what we say is like, the worst thing you can do is to just stop paying your rent. I mean, have that conversation with your landlord um, because there's, there's all sorts of ways that we can structure this so that it works for everyone. Um, I know we are getting questions coming through um, in the Q&A section below, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to um, keep all the questions and answer them at the end. Um, but for now, we want to hear from you guys, um, your thoughts. So just related to um, pretty much the topic that, that Sonia's just covered along with uh, the other speakers, um, I'll ask our marketing team to bring up the first poll because it's on that issue on uh, the relief measures um, that have been put in place um, for, landlord, for tenants by landlords. In your opinion, and obviously this is a broad question and it's probably going to change um, by, <laughs> by retailer or by, uh, by sector, um, do you think that these were not enough? Were they sufficient or were they too much? So we'll give you guys a couple of seconds to, to give your input on that. Um, I'll just let the panelists know you guys cannot vote. You, you, you get to have your say enough on this. It's time for us to listen to everyone else. So we'll let this run for a couple of seconds. Um, Okay, so that uh, I think has closed now. Here we go. Um, were the measures, they were sufficient. So broadly speaking, um, everyone seems to be fairly happy with, well, maybe happy is the wrong word, <laughs> but um, it, it seems like we are reaching um, solutions between the parties, which is great. Um, there's very few who, who say that uh, the measures were too much, which I, I think was probably to be expected. Um, so you will actually get the results of all these polls emailed to you at the end of the webinar as well, along with the link of the recording. So I think let's, let's move on now because there's obviously the, the rental issue is a, it's a big one, but there's so many factors at play here and it's really important that we cover every aspect. And so to give a few examples of this, we have Gavin Cox, who is Brol's Group Managing Director for West Africa and Namibia. Now, Gavin, this rather unique situation that we find ourselves in requires innovative but sensible solutions which strike a balance for both landlords and for tenants. What are some of the ways you've been providing assistance to help manage the financial risk of your clients? Thank you, Jess. Before I um, answer your question, I just need to give a little bit of update to all of those participants out there, because I can't see you, um, but I know that my dear colleague, Leonard Micho, is out there. He sent me a message and said, I like your glasses, Gavin. That looks great. I'm um, looking forward to, to hearing from you. So hello, Leonard, um, and hello, everybody out there. Um, looking forward to speaking to you. Um, first of all, a little bit of background about myself. I spent seven years of my life in uh, Nigeria with Brol. And it was an excellent experience. And we thought we'd seen it all. Um, 2016 came along with a financial crisis and we, we thought we'd seen it all, really we did. And um, we, we tried our best to recover from that and we were just doing that. And uh, we thought we'd really made good progress. And then came along the unprecedented COVID-19. And I, I gotta be honest, we, we really didn't expect it to arrive in 2020. We thought it would go over our heads, only stay in China and not come to see us or visit us, but so it did. And um, it hit us, uh, we took the wind out of our sails and we've had to deal with it. And um, both um, myself representing Brol and our landlords have had a look at the, the opportunities um, to be taken with COVID-19 because they always are. And most of our landlords um, have taken out um, insurance uh, for loss of turnover across Africa. And uh, we had to find processes to deal with um, the uh, communication of those, of those concessions particularly. 
Um, otherwise, it would have been a potential to void some of that insurance. So we did that and it was very successful. And um, we, we look forward to the, um, the progress as we go forward. Uh, but ultimately, it's up to the tenants ultimately to, to accept those concessions that have been provided. Um, but so far, it has been a great success and um, a positive story out of COVID-19. Um, so potentially going forward, we, um, we look forward to the future opportunities that COVID will bring us. And I think our whole landscape has changed. Um, everything is different and, I'm, and it's gonna be very different going forward. Um, I really see that uh, with homeschooling, um, which we are all battling and, uh, and dealing with currently. Um, and uh, COVID will uh, definitely challenge us going forward. So there you go, Jess. Um, that's from my side. And um, yeah, I don't know if there are any more further questions, but that's, that's it from my side. That's great. Thanks, Gavin. I think we'll have some, some questions towards the end um, about, uh, about some of your markets. So we'll hold Fantastic. those. Fantastic. Yeah, looking forward to that. And um, Leonard, I hope I did okay. Thanks, Gavin. Okay, so now let's look towards the future for a bit. Um, and of course, valuations are a key part of that, especially in unlocking capital and, and transaction and deal flow. So just to discuss this, we have on the panel Vivian Ombuayo, who is Director of Valuations at Broad Kenya. Now, Vivian, it's fair to say that valuers have no more of a crystal ball than anyone else in the world at the moment. And yet you need to prepare valuations that see into the future. What's your approach to valuations during this tricky time and how do you manage the uncertainty? Well, thank you, Jess, for uh, that uh, fantastic question. I think to answer that question, we have to start off with the, uh, just appreciating the approaches to valuations, which are the income approach, the cost approach, and the market approach, what other people might call comparables approach. So with the income approach, as Sonja mentioned pr uh, previously, is that we are now having to have like a proper an, a sit down and meeting with, uh, you know, property assets to understand the level of heat that they're, they've taken in regards to rental uh, decline. So uh, Sonja mentioned that, uh, you know, we can even experience up to 50% of uh, uh, rental decline in uh, especially commercial properties. And this is just mainly driven by rent deferments or, or discounts or waivers. And also just some uh, upright terminating their leases, which again, uh, eventually affects uh, the vacancy levels of, uh, of such properties. So we take into account all that and have to also adjust the uh, you know, previous cap rates and uh, discount rates to match the effect or the risk attributed to this. The other approach which is uh, also hugely affected is the market approach. So um, it's, uh, we understand indeed there's a current response to COVID-19 that uh, we are faced with the unprecedented set of circumstances on which to base a judgment. We appreciate that fact. And for us to move forward, uh, we consider or we have attached less weight to previous uh, market ev evidence, you know, the transactions uh, for comparison purposes to inform opinions of value. Um, the other aspect is that we are now taking into account with, uh, the further analysis of these values uh, through uh, tools like um, sensitivity and Monte Carlo's uh, simulation. So we are able to uh, assist our investors or uh, you know, property owners understand the effect of changing one variable or uh, a number of variables, the, the effect it has on the value. We value for the long term. And so due to the uncertainty levels, we are a bit conservative, uh, but uh, still uh, offer believable values and uh, take into account the highest and best use of that property. We've seen uh, recently, well, even before COVID, and now especially uh, during this COVID period, 
is that uh, properties uh, or land owners and now property owners are now considering um, you know limiting or reducing uh, functional obsolescence of uh, of uh, assets that have been majorly hit by by the covid pandemic uh, for instance we're seeing uh, hotels uh, repurposing to maybe offices so uh, we take all that into account uh, in, uh, in uh, carrying out our evaluations. Fantastic. Thank you, Vivian. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's all about what's going to happen in the future, when a, when a trading level is going to, to return. And on, on that note, um, I think let's bring up the, the next poll question. Um, and it's to get a, a sense from, from everyone when do you think Africa's economy will start its recovery? So the question is not, when do you think we will be back to pre-COVID levels? It was, it's when do you think it will start? And uh, there've been so many ideas floating around in the market about all these letters. Is it gonna be a V shape, a U shape, a, an L shape, a, a W, a, uh, the, the Nike swoosh has been <laughs> raised as an idea. Um, but, but the question is, when is that turning point? And I think once, once we have a collective sense of, of when that turning point is, it makes it a little bit easier for, for everyone to plan um, and, and have a little bit more confidence about when some sort of stability will enter back into the market. Um, so that's your question there. When do you think Africa's economy will start its recovery? And we obviously recognize that each country might be different. Um, and that's why we've, we've grouped them into fairly, um, fairly loose uh, uh, time periods there. Um, so do you think it will be in the second half of this year, the first half of next year, the second half of next year, or do you think it will only start later? So I think that's closed and let's look at the results. Okay, so, so very few people expecting to see the beginnings of a recovery coming through towards the end of this year. Um, and a fairly even split between the first half and the second half of, of next year. So I think if you took the weighted average, maybe, maybe let's say July next year could be, the, uh, <laughs> could be the turning point if we were to average out everyone. Um, of course, there's about 20%, 19% there um, who think that it will be only from 2022 onwards. Um, so, of course, very, very broad questions, but it's interesting to see uh, what people's expectations are at a high level. Okay, so, so clearly from that answer, uh, we can see that the future is uncertain, um, but it's certainly going to look quite different. And so here I'll introduce Balaji Edu, who's the CEO of Brawl Nigeria. And Balaji, we all know that the consumer forms the basis of the value chain that we mentioned earlier, and clearly consumer behaviours are being forced to change. Um, and this is going to result in a very different demand profile for property. How are you advising your clients to adapt to these changes? Yes, yeah, so um, thank, thank you very much, Jess, and um, good day to everyone on this, um, uh, on this webinar. Um, yeah, so... Um, I deal that from the retailer uh, perspective, um, some of this has been touched on earlier by um, Sonia and um, Moses amongst others. Um, you know, there, there will be sort of winners and losers and, um, you know, the, the retailers that do the e-commerce um, in their delivery capability um, are likely to be the ones that sort of come out, uh, you know, the, the winners, uh, you know, the winners here. Um, you know, obviously that will also lead to other investment and development opportunities in uh, warehousing and, um, and logistics as, as well. Um, I think that as so touched on earlier, you know, we, um, you know, the African countries need to, um, you know, to become more self-sufficient. And, you know, this needs uh, more um, investment in our um, infrastructure, um, you know, whether that is uh, um, government-led or whether that's done through um, public-private, um, you know, sort of partnerships. Um, in terms of development, um, you know, looking at Nigeria for uh, retail development, 
Um, I think that the future developments are going to be for um, small malls, which are more um, localized and more um, you know, convenience uh, focused. Um, in terms of the existing uh, large malls, which are there, they, you know, those that um, are going to be most successful are going to be those as um, uh, you know that do invest in their uh, um, you know leisure uh, you know leisure facilities within the malls. Um, you know, as Sonia mentioned earlier, um, it's important, especially in Nigeria, that um, you know people do go to the malls not just for shopping but also for you know for socialising as well. And those malls that give them the ability for um, you know leisure. Um, you know, as well, you know, will, will be, you know, will be the ones that are uh, most successful. Um, you know, looking at offices, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things with COVID is that there, there is, a, you know, a, a fear of, uh, of uh, you know, sort of public transport and commuting. Um, I think that's not just in Africa, but sort of, um, you know, globally, as, you know, as well. And, um, in, you know, we may still see opportunities in the grade B office, um, office buildings, but outside of the um, CBDs, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, sub, sub hubs within the cities. So in Nigeria, if we look at, um, you know, places on the mainland like Ikeja um, and sort of going further down the, um, you know, the, the, the Lekki corridor as well. Great, thanks, Balaji. And I think your point on um, the the take up of, of e-commerce or online delivery uh, platforms and, and solutions, I think, is you know we've seen in so many markets where it was it was right at the beginning of its its journey has now just really accelerated off the charts. So that's actually the topic for the the next poll that we have, um, and it's about the the take up of e-commerce. Um, and the question is, do you think that e-commerce will put a halt to the expansion of retail brands into shopping centers in Africa, or really will it, will it change the way that brands enter new markets? So firstly, do you think that brands will now stick to their own markets? Do you think that brands will enter new African markets in the traditional formal shopping centers as they have before? Do you think that they will enter new markets, but with an online e-commerce solution? Or finally, do you think that they will continue to enter new markets, but now they will have a much more of a, a hybrid of formal and e-commerce solutions? So I guess the question is, firstly, do you think brands will continue to expand into Africa? And then if they are going to continue to expand, is it using the same old methods or are they going to adopt or completely uh, shift over to an e-commerce platform? And this can be um, uh, brands coming from, from any part of the world. Um, I know we've traditionally had a lot of, of South African brands moving into um, other markets in Africa. We've seen lately a lot of brands from um, Turkey, for instance, um, and other, other countries in Europe. Um, yeah, has, has the, the change in the world meant that, that these brands are going to stick to their own countries or change the way they move? So yeah, a fairly solid um, answer there um, that, that most brands we expect will take a hybrid approach. So perhaps some form of a, a traditional shopping center footprint, um, but coupling that with an e-commerce solution. So obviously that has implications both on the, um, on the shopping centers um, in terms of the types of boxes that, uh, that the centers will need, but also um, how they can manage things like delivery platforms, um, logistics, warehousing. So that's actually really interesting um, to see the implications across the, the different sectors there. And I think one of the things that, that makes these solutions so interesting but challenging is that all of this is happening within a really complex environment. So on that point, I'll turn to Terence McCarry, who's the Managing Director of Roll Namibia. Now, governments, new economic reform programs might differ and many medium to long-term strategies are being revised. But what are some of the initiatives that we need to focus on now? Thanks, Jess, and good day to everyone that is part of this webinar. Let me start off by saying that COVID-19 has created a business unusual situation 
for all industries globally. And we will be confronted by the reality of having to revisit business models, rethink the way we do business, rethink how we interact and engage in public spaces. And we must expect governments dictating new standards aimed at protect, protecting society. After all, we must be cognizant that we are in business because societies, are, societies allows us to be in business. We therefore have to adopt and ensure that we address society's fears relating to their safety, hygiene, and health. As a consequence, business will not go back to the way we knew before the pandemic, but will have to reinvent themselves to be more resilient and adapt their operations to the new normal. As such, there is a need to meaningfully engage with all key stakeholders on health and safety in physical spaces, as well as policy changes that we need to reignite our economies. I'll briefly touch on four areas where we need to see robust and meaningful changes from governments and industries regulating themselves in the absence of government policy. The first one is health and social protection. We have seen governments prioritizing policies ranging from testing and treatment, hiring new or retired medical staff, acquiring medical equipment, creating temporary treatment centers, expanding social assistance, implementing social distancing, and mandatory sanitation stations, as well as the wearing of masks. While these were during the state of emergencies, some are bound to become the norm and could have an impact on operating cost uh, for our industry. In terms of self-regulation, the real estate sector may have to adopt COVID smart or COVID safe standards for themselves. And this presents an opportune time for us as an industry to self-regulate and not wait on government to, to, to detect to us with government regulations and policies. Another regulatory impact on the real estate sector will be within the commercial office space. With the multi-year trend towards densification and open plan layouts having to reverse sharply as building requirements may be adjusted by public health officials, potentially impacting on square footage per person, the standards of HVAC systems and the amount of closed space required. In terms of urbanization, the long-term trend in urbanization is unlikely to be slowed by the pandemic, but it will prompt a rethink in urban designs that will develop scalable smart city solutions. Again, this will come with cost implications to all asset classes as governments changes the regulations and the requirements and control measures. Last point on this the policy framework, it's possibly on sustainability. There will be an increased spotlight on corporate social responsibilities. And through this, we may see some regulations with mandatory obligations on businesses. Second area is fiscal policy. There will be measures targeting efforts on revenue side with initiatives, such as deferring payments and legal filings, reducing employer social contributions, allocating low interest loans to firms, reprioritizing spending and governments will unfortunately have to deal with how they finance these large scale uh, fiscal deficits, deficits that they're going to experience. Another measure we have seen is the fiscal stimulus is introduced. These will have to continue to con secure the continued existence of businesses and to safeguard jobs. Looking at our industry, we are entering a stage where the new norm could be scores of tenants across asset classes asking for concessions, rebates, or rental reductions, which becomes another area where we can self-regulate by coming up with the necessary regulations. But in the absence of that, some governments may issue regulations to mitigate potential legal disputes. The third area is monetary policy. Despite record low interest rates, many major central banks still have room to cut policy rates. We can also not rule out the possibility of providing liquidity to solvent banks the scope of credit programs must be expanded, making funds available to companies, including SMEs that have lesser safety nets, and also don't rule out the possibility of corporate tax reductions. The fourth and last area I would look at is financial and trade policies. And these will range from reductions in collateral requirements, streamlining business registration processes, revisiting FDR regulations, reducing import restrictions and tariffs, and getting closer to our industry, and I think someone have touched on it earlier, we may even see restrictions on evictions, and also we may see more tenant protectionist policies. It is essential that these measures are timely, targeted, and transparent. This will require collaboration with all stakeholders to co-create measures 
that will ensure sustainable businesses, yet not compromise on public health and safety. In conclusion, it is imperative that governments and us as industry act with the speed of execution never seen before and will soon and rather than later need to adjust these mitigating measures and ease the prevailing strict measures to make sure we get our, our economies back on track. Thanks, Jess. I hand back to you with that contribution. Thank you so much, Terence. Uh, that's a really, really interesting input. And I must apologize to everyone. It looks like we might run a few minutes over time. I think it's just been such a, an interesting discussion that we didn't want to, to cut off any of the speakers. Um, so, so if you do need to drop out, we, we will understand um, that we will continue on. Um, we have one last poll question for you all. Um, so as Terence mentioned, the, uh, uh, the, the demand for officers is likely to change um, and we do expect that it will reduce in the short term as, as you know, as it linked to the economy. But what do you think are gonna, is going to happen to space requirements in the long term? Will it reduce? Will it re return to previous levels or will it increase? Um, we've given a few ideas about why each of those might have happened, but I think the, the question here is more around um, long term. Will the demand for office space reduce, return to previous levels, or will it increase? So obviously more, more companies are, are now seeing that work from home and agile solutions can work. So that could decrease the total space needed. Um, similarly, though, the, the need for socially, social distancing, um, you know, having six foot of office space, as our, our partners say, um, that, that might increase the, the space per person that we need. Or is it going to sort of remain on par um, as a, those two measures might offset each other, but also just because people need, need interaction. Um, so we'll just ask for your opinions there. And I think the results should come up quickly. Okay, so again, fairly overwhelming um, an expectation <coughs> that the total space requirements will reduce. Um, and we expect that, I mean, obviously there could be a number of factors here, but um, the, the drive to, to work from home and agile solutions um, will probably drive that. So, so looking into the future again and, and bringing us back full circle to Malcolm Horn. So Malcolm, there is so often opportunity in crisis and our response to this crisis, I think highlights the opportunity for technology as a solution. What's your vision for the technology offerings to the property market in the not so distant future? Thanks, Jess. Um, I think uh, you, you're quite right. And as Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, because I think a crisis produces three types of opportunities, a technology opportunity, market opportunities, and then obviously just normal performance, risk avoidance, and, and, and those type of opportunities. But let's op focus on the technology opportunity because I think that's extremely exciting for the real estate sector because I think we've got a sector that has been slow to embrace technology. Um, and the reason for the slow embracing of technology, although it's such a large sector, I think there's been a lot of comfort zones and a lot of people that are thinking, well, it's working, so why do we need to reinvent it and rediscover it? And I think COVID has shaken that core belief um, in a lot of people, and a lot more of innovation is coming to the fore where people are looking to technology and solutions of technology. And if I just think of our own business, um, what binds a Vivian and a Bilagi and a you and all of us together is our technology platform in our business. Um, and I think that's the exciting space is creating a technology platform that actually is multifaceted, not only talking to us as a service provider, but to as a user of space or um, a, an investor of space. And, and that's what we have designed. So we're very early adopters of technology. Um, we've had our own internal technology development team for more than 20 years within our business. And um, we're very excited because um, we're launching our, our commercialized technology offering to the market in the third quarter of this year. Um, and it's really world-class. It, it operates across nine continents, end-to-end um, -end solutions in, in the real estate sector. And, um, but more than that, I think it's embracing the market opportunities in technology in Africa, because PropTech has really developed um, of late across the continent in quite an alarming rate. Um, but there's no real platform from, for the PropTech industry to plug into and to have a homegrown 
African solution to African real estate. So I think very excited that we're going to be embracing the market, the opportunities um, that the market present. And in addition to that, I think we've got a generation in Africa. And if you look at the three elements, you've got a, you've got a very tech savvy generation, you've got culture that's busy changing, and you've got a sustainable real estate sector at the top. And if you put all of those together with a wonderful technology solution, I think that spells opportunity for the real estate sector. So very exciting for me. Absolutely, thank you, Malcolm. I think that, that is the future. And it's really exciting to see this next frontier in our industry and to be part of that, um, especially considering um, the remarkable transformation that Africa has already undergone in recent decades. And I think to, for us to sustain beyond the coronavirus, we need a, a deeper understanding and conversation um, around the challenges out there. And there's an even greater need for business to focus on growth, agility, sustainability. And really, that's why we as Roll are hosting these webinars um, in the interest of creating that new ecosystem of African business stakeholders and to unite the industries and sectors that can support one another. Um, and so as we close out uh, the discussion part of this webinar, we thank everyone who has joined today for being a part of that ecosystem of stakeholders. We hope that you'll join us for the next in this series of Africa webinars. Um, the next one will be on Wednesday, the 15th of July at 12 o'clock Central African time. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists for sharing their expertise and their stories today. And although this concludes the, the formal discussion portion of the webinar, we are going to stay online for probably another 15 or so minutes to try and answer some of the questions that have been raised um, from the attendees. So everyone is welcome to stick around for that. But if not, thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Right, so we have some questions that have come through um, and we have a few from, from uh, our clients and some that have been submitted beforehand. I think the ones that have been shared uh, throughout the webinar, um, our Divisional Director and Head of Group Marketing, Andy Le Rapier, will also help select and, and direct these. But let's start first with the ones that have, have come through previously. So the first one, um, is from Gabby Sutole, who's the Director of Growth Point Investec African Properties Limited. Um, and it's a question around retail. Um, I think perhaps I might throw this one over to Nkuli, um, although perhaps Gavin might want to jump in as well. So the question says, in the past, we have had a pipeline of tenants and retailers from South African retailers coming to West Africa and establishing trade. But we also have seen most of them leave over the years. So in recent years, we have seen some come from Turkey, et cetera. Where does Brawl believe the next new wave of retailers will be coming from to establish business in West Africa? Thank you for that question, Gabby. Thank you, Jess. Um, I think for me, I'd like to just uh, highlight the Africa continental free trade that will be launched very soon. I think it's a great opportunity for African countries to start trading amongst each other um, and the ease of doing business while we're doing so um, with all the governments you know, coming together and being more intentional about this. So even though we've seen um, some of our South African companies going out into West Africa and perhaps not being very successful because um, it was the first plunge, but also um, you know, there's, there's the notion of taking what happens and what works in South Africa and thinking you can plug it in directly into another market just the way that it is, you know. So hopefully there's been some lessons learned and those who will go after them would have learned those lessons and, and that, you know, all these countries are not the same. Some countries are, are more exposed and more sophisticated than others. Some countries are still on their development path. Um, so I think we, we should all uh, be encouraged by the policies and the enabling environment that the Africa free trade will, will enable us to do and encourage those retailers. And I do still think that um, South African companies might still go out and pursue opportunities in other countries, but also other countries starting to explore uh, in other different markets. Yeah, I don't know if Gavin has anything else more, more insight. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I think it's probably 
important to mention that we've done extensive work over the last three years trying to gather international tenants for West Africa particularly, um, because our pool is very, very shallow and um, we really need uh, variety in the sense of our tenant mix. And um, with the departure of South African tenants, it just has intensified that problem. So we've done a lot of work in building relationships with Turkish tenants um, and a number of other international tenants. But with the, with the effects of COVID, um, most of those tenants have gone back into hibernation and are looking at the primary markets and making sure that they survive COVID. But I'm very confident that with the relationships that we have forged, that um, within the next six to 12 months, we can reconnect um, and we can offer those opportunities to them again. Um, some of them probably will not be as keen to come back to West Africa, but I'm sure that they on the Turkish front where they get incentives to expand into, into new markets will still be on the radar. So I'm, I'm very comfortable that COVID-19 will be overcome with particular um, focus on new business. Um, but I particularly will focus on Turkey because that is where the, the potential growth for us is going forward. Fantastic. Thank you, yeah, Jess. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, I think to include his point, the, um, the, the regional opportunities, I think, are really exciting. And it's, it's the sort of thing that, that was already starting to happen before COVID started. So it might be a solution that, that we accelerate. So I think 100%. that... We, we have the next question here. Um, it's actually on valuations um, with a focus on retail. So I'll throw it to Vivian and probably Sonia to jointly answer from two different perspectives. Um, the question comes from Keegan Osha, who's a fourth year BSc property study student at Fitz University. Um, and the question is, I would like to ask the panel how the effects of COVID-19 would affect the portfolio valuations of the large REITs, particularly those with large retail exposure. Valuations will obviously decrease, but some additional insight into how much they will be affected will be appreciated. So Vivian, do you want to speak to that from a valuation perspective first? And then um, maybe Sonia can help answer um, around the, the quantum of changes, which will obviously be linked to, to changes in income streams. Yeah. OK, thank you, Jess, for that. Um, yes, yeah, so with the decline in uh, rental income, of course, that will eventually change the bottom line, which is your net operating income, which eventually uh, has a declining effect on the value. So for us, how we do it is that we carry out a discounted cash flow, maybe five years. And we are now um, like deferring the rental projection of the next two years because of COVID to, uh, uh, to take into account uh, uh, what Sonja already mentioned, you know, the effects on uh, uh, rental uh, income due to rent deferments or waivers or even uh, rent discounts. So we defer that uh, uh, revenue onto and then stabilize that into the uh, final years of the cash flow analysis. And uh, over and above that, we also, uh, as Alia mentioned, adjust uh, the cap rate, the reversionary or exit cap rate and the discount rate to reflect the effect of this, uh, uh, of the pandemic. Great, thanks Vivian. I think Sonia, in terms of the, the inputs into those valuations, things like rental levels, vacancies, um, how do you think that's going to impact the values going forward? I wish I had a crystal ball, Jess. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's 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 quite difficult to look into the future, especially when it becomes, you know, time for valuations. Um, 
you know, retail that has had the most rental reduction granted. So it's obvious that the valuations, you know, will be impacted. Um, uh, it is very difficult for us to predict. Um, and therefore, we need to build that relationship with the tenant, you know, to see um, what his cash flow looks like um, and move closer to the, to the retailer. Because the closer we move to the retailer to understand his business, the easier it becomes for us to make assumptions on income level from that specific tenant going forward. You know, he might still have a five-year lease, which is currently being used for valuations, but he might be defaulting in the new future. Um, and therefore, it's very important that we build that relationship with, with that tenant. Um, and then we can look at, you know, will the vacancy increase? What's the likelihood of finding another tenant? Um, yeah, I think on, even on the vacancy assumptions, um, it is quite difficult at the moment to understand. We know you, we used to make vacancy assumptions on three, six months periods, but um, you know, where do we where do we go from here? So it's still unclear to what degree at this stage um, the assumptions of income will be. Um, I think what makes us a little bit worried is that we might be signing shorter term leases at the moment, which we shouldn't be. So let's be cognizant of that. Uh, as we go into renewal phases. Jess, can I, can I say something about Because I think we've got to keep perspective on values. So I think you can't value in the midst of a crisis. I think that would be the one thing to, to remember. And the other thing in terms of a REIT, that was the question, is there is an expiry profile um, of leases. So they don't all expire at one point in time. Um, so I think be wary just to talk value in the in the heat of a crisis. I think value should hold. It might differ, but it's not going to it's not going to fall um, to to the bottom bottomless levels of pits because there is structure to valuation and to the structured income in in REITs. Absolutely, and I think your your point on the um, the expiry profile and the the tenant mix. I mean, that's where a a very clever leasing strategy will be worth its weight in gold to um, to, to ensure that 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 is balanced. So we've got um, so Balaji, we've got a question on Nigeria. Um, so we'll ask for you to to take this one. Question uh, is from anonymous, mm -hmm. and they ask. How would the pandemic affect the demand for grade B commercial buildings in prominent areas in Nigeria, such as Victoria Island and Ikoi? Balaji, you're just on mute, so I'll just ask you to unmute as you go in to answer that question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that question. Um, for, for that question, Jess. Um, I, I think that there, there, you know, so probably so two uh, forces which are going to be so sort of driving this. Um, you know, one is that obviously with with Nigeria, you you've got to look at the um, you know, the, the the FX rate and the, the you know the currency as well. Um, you know, and the fact that um, if there might be um, a move towards more uh, grade B buildings because um, the, the you know the cost of uh, grade A buildings are getting um, you know are getting sort of too expensive. That that might be a, a move from uh, from from one side. There's the, there's the um, cost there's the cost implication. Um, however, you know from the international companies and the um, uh, the, the multinationals and and, and 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 the like, they might move from the you know from the grade B buildings into the grade A buildings, which have um, you know which are you know sort of <laughs> COVID re resistant. If you um, you know that they they do have a um, you know mo modern um, HVAC system. You know they do have the um, you know the the, the touchless um, uh, entry and sort of exit uh, sort of systems, um, you know, they, they are managed to, um, you know, in, international standards as well. So um, I, I, I think that there will be moves in, you know, there will be moves in both directions. I, I, I don't think that there, it will be a straight 
uh, fleeing away from um, you know great bee buildings in uh, Ikoyi and Victoria Island. Great, thanks, Balaji. Um, the next question that I want to to address, um, I'm actually going to pose it to Malcolm because it fits quite nicely with uh, something you just mentioned, um, and it's on that tenant mix, um, and it's from Edward Joshua who asks. Will tenant mix change into the future? Uh, thanks, Ed, and thanks for the question. Um, thanks, Jess. I think tenant mix will change into the future. I think, you know, we've already seen it in retail. We've seen retail shopping centers moving towards more community focused and relevance to communities that they serve. So whether it be additional schools, um, uh, you could have churches, you've got more facilities that it sort of becomes a town centre um, more than anything else. And I think you're going to find the same thing if you talk about mix in office buildings, where you're going to get more flexible workspace. Um, so, so you're not going to get the traditional makeup of a corporate lease. You could have a multiple layer of leases or smaller businesses leasing space. Um, so I think, yes, there are going to be changes and it's all going to be demand driven. Um, but I think our, our work is going to be cut out to make sure that the leasing strategies are sound, pure, generating uh, additional feet and revenue at the same time. And I think we've seen a lot of landlords embracing that um, and not necessarily just saying we need rental. We might have new anchor tenants coming into retail space at, um, on different lease terms and, and different positioning strategies of retail might happen and I think will happen. Um, and we're seeing it across the continent. If I might add to that, Jess, I think what's also come out that is very important in the South African context was the Competition Commission's ruling in terms of the big nationals uh, not being allowed anymore to just take over and sign exclusivity in terms of, you know, um, having having a checkers and only a checkers in a, in a specific shopping center. So that, that will go a long way in terms of um, encouraging competition and making sure that we have newcomers into the space. And I think it's also, you know, something worthwhile highlighting is while we have seen um, the COVID impact on, on the retail sector, um, you know, the pickup, the pickup that we saw in May is a true sign that without the bricks and mortar shopping centers that we have, a lot of our retailers actually um, are desperate to come back into the bricks and mortar and be able to sell their products. So e-commerce platforms are great, but uh, I think bricks and mortar is, is even more so greater. So the hybrid is going to be necessary. And I think um, there is definitely still a future for our investors. Jess, if I may just add the last thing on, on that would also be, I think the traditional old leasing strategies were done um, with limited information at people's disposal. And I think big data and data analytics are going to come into play when analyzing what to do in the retail space. And we're seeing it already in our research in the Intel business where we're analyzing rural retails come back um, and all kinds of other trends that are happening in that space, which will talk to the new tenant mix of tomorrow. Cheers, if I may come in. Yes, go for it, Terence. Uh, I also just want to add from the uh, com competition uh, regulators, uh, which is a trend we have seen in Namibia, where this, this seems to be leaning towards possibly putting in a minimum requirement for shopping malls to provide a platform for local tenants, because it's just seen as you've got all these big nationals coming in, taking up all the space, but uh, and, and um, shopping malls not providing a platform for your smaller locals. And there has been consideration of even maybe coming up with a minimum requirement of a percentage of local retailers that you need to have in the mall. So yes, it's gonna impact on, on mix going forward if these type of regulations are to come forward. Fantastic, thanks Terence. I think we've, we've pretty much hit the limit on our, our time. Unfortunately, there's a few questions that we haven't managed to get to. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the questions that are coming through show that, you know, the, the way that the industry is thinking is, is certainly um, alive and well and, and healthy in terms of our, our approach to getting through these challenges. Um, and I think we, we would prefer to answer the questions with a focus on quality rather than just getting through the quantity. So we will have to save some of them for the next one. Um, 
specifically I see that there's a there's a question on prop tech. Um, so that one we will definitely cover um, in in one of the future webinars, if not the next one. Um, so on that note, thank you again to all the panelists for sharing uh, your knowledge and experience um, and your ideas for the future. And thank you to everyone who has joined us and we hope to see you again at the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jess. Thank you.